Welcome to the High Voltage Light Electric Vehicle Channel. This is the weekly look at interesting technology and trends in e-bikes and light electric vehicles. This week's video looks at a couple of battery or energy storage formats that have been talked about for a really long time and promise much but have remained largely a bit of a pipe dream and something in a lab and not the wider world. These two technologies are supercapacitors and sodium ion batteries. We're now though seeing the first few consumer products to use this technology. So the question that this video will explore is whether this is another false dawn or if 2024 is the year when some of these technologies are finally able to move people and cargo around. The first thing to look at is in a bike made by a Dutch company and it caught my attention because it's the first bike that I've seen that's making a big deal of supercapacitors or ultra capacitors if you want in the place of your traditional lithium ion battery. I have a very healthy dose of skepticism when it comes to these because they've always been one of these bits of tech that promises to be game changing and then the reality is somewhat different. I think there was this company called EE Store and they made a big thing in the early 2000s about their amazing capacitors and then it came to nothing. There were a lot of people that invested in it and nothing came from it. This Dutch company, however, is using them with their bikes and is actually providing a four year warranty for the capacitor component. They're also giving a pretty bullish figure on the range of the bike, but you do need to look at it within the context of who is and where they'll be using the bike. This is something that's been created for a very specific place and market. The idea of using capacitors as batteries to store energy has been around for a long time and it's an attractive proposition because you can charge them very fast, you can get lots more life cycles out of them, you can charge them when they're cold, they have a high rate of discharge, they don't burst into flames when damaged and they emit far less toxic smoke if they are to burn and they don't as far as I'm aware reach the point of thermal runaway. The issue has always been one of energy density and this is something that has improved over time it used to be that the best capacitors had an energy density of 10 watt hours per kilogram, which doesn't stack up at all against lithium ion batteries. The idea is an attractive one though, and investment in the technology has moved forward. And you can find companies now making capacitors that have an energy density of 70 to 90 watt hours per kilogram, which is still a long way from lithium batteries. The capacitors used in this bike are from a company called Fastcap in the USA and they've attracted considerable government investment, which based on this bike appears to have paid off. The energy storage for the bike is listed at 540 watt hours and weighs in at seven kilograms. So you can do a quick bit of math and you can get 77 watt hours per kilogram. From this, they're giving it a top range of 120 kilometers. And I'm always super skeptical with ranges and e-bikes. Everyone always pumps them up. But this is a very low powered pedal assist bike for use in a very, very flat country. Holland. Everything about this bike is tailored to the Dutch rider, from its vandal proof design to its bright Dutch orange paint job. I like the look of this bike. I know it's not some super high powered machine, but from a design perspective, it's not only practical, but I think it's nice to look at. It's powered by a tiny mid drive, drum brakes front and rear, and the gearing is kind of set for riding on the flat. I'm really shocked at the price as well. This comes with a four year warranty for a frame and battery, yet costs with the current discount about $2,500. Right, I know it's not a super high power machine, but you really need to look at this in the context of where it's meant to be used. This is a Dutch bike designed to be used in places like Amsterdam and in a country where it's almost completely flat, where there's a huge network of designated and segregated bike lanes where etiquette is ingrained into all road users and pedestrians, where there are plenty of places to lock up bikes. I don't see this being particularly practical where I live because there are lots of hills. The power that the motor can produce is pretty low, the capacitors would be drained pretty quickly, and I wouldn't want to mix it in traffic with this, but Dutch riders don't have to. This has been designed for the daily commuter using their networks. As such, it has drum brakes, a solid frame. It's very uncomplicated. It has a max assisted speed of 25 kph because that's the speed that will fit with everyone else using the bike networks. It does not need to have a huge energy capacity as the power levels needed to get people about in the flat at those kind of speeds are minimal. So the fact that the energy density of the capacitors is lower than lithium doesn't really matter in this case. Even if the person was to deplete all of the charge, with this they can charge it in about 10 minutes while grabbing a coffee. 
the fact that there's no lithium ion battery involved may well make it viable for somebody that wants to charge one of these while they're at work or even in a multi-person condo unit. I'm not making this video about battery safety, but there are places now that won't permit lithium ion battery charging. So something like this could be more acceptable. I'm not sure that this bike represents a place where capacitors have finally come of age, more that they work for this specific vehicle. I don't see them working so much where you need to use higher power, you will run that small capacity down very fast. I think using these to move heavier vehicles and cargo might be a long way off. However, it's really good to see them in a vehicle and being used to actually move people rather than another story making lofty promises that always seems to be over the horizon. Hopefully they can continue to work in this technology because to make a supercapacitor is less energy and resource intensive than lithium. They don't use cobalt, they're potentially easy to recycle. They also work effectively in a huge temperature range. You don't have to keep them warm like you do with say a Tesla car battery in winter conditions. There's a lot of money going into the development of this technology. So I see no reason why the energy density can't be increased. Some labs are even making claims of up to 200 watt hours now per kilogram. However, nothing approaching this has actually been delivered in terms of a product that can be used economically. But still, 77 watt hours per kilogram in this bike is a huge jump from the 10 watt hours per kilogram that was previously given as the limit not so long ago. Just want to say at this point, if you are enjoying this video, please leave me a like and consider subscribing. And if you have already done those things, it's greatly appreciated and really, really helps to spread the video. Thank you very much. While I'm looking at energy storage technology and energy density, there are a few others that we can look at. If we can start making viable vehicles for certain use scenarios with supercapacitors, there is also sodium batteries. These can have an energy density of 120 watt hours per kilogram, which again is not really competitive with lithium in terms of density. But there are also some case use scenarios where it really does not need to be. Sodium iron again is an attractive chemistry because it has better low temperature performance than lithium, faster charging speeds and a longer lifespan. The components are also significantly cheaper than lithium, which would reduce the cost of electric vehicles. They're also much less of a hazard if they catch fire and don't thermally run away. I realize that this here is a car, but it's also a very compact and lightweight car, and it's gonna be the first passenger vehicle using sodium ion batteries. This is heavy, heavy backing from Volkswagen. The price of these as well is very, very interesting. They are around 7,000 to 8,000 US dollars, which is vastly cheaper than pretty much any other electric car or vehicle I can think of. In a time when everything just seems to get more and more expensive, this could be a real bonus. Compared to something like, say, a Nissan Leaf or the cheapest Tesla, it's a pretty damn good price. Some of that is due to the size of the vehicle, but I suspect most of it is because the cost of the sodium ion battery is vastly cheaper, which also means it will presumably be vastly cheaper to replace said battery when its time is up. So for people this vehicle is viable for, they're saving a huge amount of money on their transport costs. One of the things that makes me really angry about electric cars right now is they tend to be an elitist status symbol. If this pans out, it could make them much more affordable to buy, maintain and run. Like, this clearly isn't the kind of vehicle that most people would want to use for an interstate journey in the US, at least until recharging networks are more built out. But in a country like UK or Europe or China, where the density of people is huge, this kind of vehicle would be able to do pretty much anything a family would want low cost, fast charging. Most journeys are not that long a distance anyway, especially for city dwellers. When you start looking at even lighter vehicles, there could be even a greater payoff here. I could see smaller one-person LEVs with this type of battery, taking people all over cities efficiently and cleanly. There are a few companies making small vehicles like this, and they have a claim range of up to 300 kilometers, which I'm gonna call BS on. Ranges are always exaggerated. It's the same with gasoline vehicles as well to some extent. But even if these only get 200 kilometers in Europe, for most people, that's probably gonna be fine. Some of this is also gonna depend on the charging networks and the speed of charging, All right? Even if I need to go to 300 kilometers, if the facilities exist and I can stop off, plug it in and have it charged to near full in the time it takes me to take a leak, stretch my legs and have a coffee, does it really matter that it can't do the 300 kilometers in one go? By 2026, 
These companies claim they will be able to have an energy density for sodium batteries of 200 watt hours per kilogram, which is much more competitive with lithium. I don't think that the sodium ion cells are going to be found in e-bikes particularly soon, mainly because of discharge rates. With things like e-bikes, the discharge rating of the cells is important because people often use quite small batteries with relatively low numbers of parallel groups to get them to fit. A car with the room for many more groups of cells is more viable with less load on each group of cells. Overall though, I think these are exciting times and encouraging because it seems to me that some of the technologies that have been touted around for many years are now reaching the point where they're ready to move from beyond just theory and laboratories to the real world, where they can start moving around people and goods. As with everything, it's important to have a healthy dose of skepticism. It's up to these companies to prove these products work. As always, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments and on Discord. Next week, I'm gonna explore the topic of graphene, which is another one of those technologies which everyone went nuts over when it was developed and all these game-changing ideas were proposed and very little seems to have come of it. Anyway, that's it for this week. Thanks for listening and special thanks to all the channel members and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.